Okay, so I am trying yet again to make a recording of this um, PowerPoint so that I can have this available for everybody uh, on the modules. Uh, so this is the PowerPoint that goes with chapter eight um, in week nine. Uh, chapter eight is the overview chapter that kicks off the material um, for this next unit. Uh, and this is sort of the introductory, um, big broad picture of the incredible growth and development in the United States for the first five decades of the 1800s, where the big story is um, just the phenomenal rapid growth in the United States on all fronts, uh, economic growth, geographic growth, political development, um, uh, development across all fronts. And especially in comparison to the much slower growth um, over the previous two centuries. So that's the big picture. Um, and your textbook uh, divides the story of this chapter up one way and as always, um, when I present in class with the lecture and my PowerPoints, and now, of course, I'll be presenting all this material to you online. Um, the purpose here is for me to cut uh, the material up a different way. And the idea is, you know, that, that by going at it from a, uh, another direction, it gives you another way to hear it, another way to look at it, and hopefully um, the one-two punch, if you will, um, is, uh, helps to set up um, a, a better platform for you to um, build your recall and build your confidence uh, in understanding the material that's presented. Um, so um, first, let's look at an overview of the um, growth in the economy. And the first big important thing here is the market revolution. Um, what is the market revolution? The soundbite of the market revolution is um, the gradual shift away from mercantilism, which was the understanding, economic understanding that drove the growth of the colonial empires in the period in the 1500s and the 1600s and the 1700s, which was that the way you got rich was through basically the control of space, the control of geography, the control of land, um, because wealth comes from land um, and from the things that you grow on the land, from the things that you dig up from the land, from the work that the people who live on the land do for you, you being the monarch, you being the government, you being the wealthy people who own the land um, or, or have um, the power to reap the wealth of the land granted to you by the monarch, uh, in the case of the Spanish empire in particular. Um, and then the monarch or the government but these are all monarchies, so that's really the same thing, um, gets their piece of the wealth um, through taxation. So um, that's why they sought then to control through direct political control through their colonial empires, um, most of the world, they divided it up, right? And then they tried to keep trade then within the bounds, the physical space of their empire. That's what the Navigation Acts were about. Um, that's what all of the tax laws were about. That's what all the rules were about. You know, the British established that, you know, certain goods had to be traded through England, that all foreign goods had to go to England first before they could be shipped to the colonies. Um, that's what that was all about. That was their understanding of wealth. But gradually, simultaneously, um, producers were discovering that they could make more money um, through figuring out how to produce more stuff um, with the same amount of space, right? So you could, as a farmer, for example, if you could figure out how to grow more stuff, more tobacco per acre, more corn per acre, more wheat per acre, um, at a lower input cost, um, then that space in between, right? Between making more for less, right? That increase in profit then, that, you know, there was no potential cap on that. Um, and that, as that becomes common sense, and of course that's gonna sound like common sense to you too, because we still live in the world created by the market revolution. Um, then, you know, human ingenuity and creativity and scientific observation skills are turned toward figuring out how to be more efficient producers, um, to, you know, make more with less uh, inputs. Um, and so, 
um, you know, people turn to old tools a lot of times to start with and figure out how to make those tools more efficient and more effective. Um, and that's what this documentary, which um, either you have already watched if you were in the Monday class or you will watch on Wednesday, um, is all about. And you need to just watch the first four segments of that documentary. You don't need to watch about the British Empire because obviously we don't care about the British Empire in the 1800s and the 1900s because that's not our story. Um, but the first four segments of that documentary give you a look at the basic tools um, that kicked off the agricultural revolution, which gives you more food um, grown by fewer and fewer people, which then frees up those people to go do other stuff. Um, um, and then the tools that create the factory, the rise of the factory, um, and which is one of the key segments here. And particularly that those factories kick off in textiles, which absorbs the cotton, um, which is grown uh, so hugely in the American South, uh, which becomes the primary producer of cotton um, that is consumed by the textile industry in Great Britain. Um, also in France, also in the Netherlands, also in Holland, and of course, ultimately also in the United States. Um, and that cotton, which of course is largely um, actually worked by um, people who are owned through slavery, um, is, uh, that's another big story that we will be exploring over the next several weeks here in this second half of the US survey. So, um, uh, and I'm just about to, uh, cough, so I'm going to pause for just a second. <coughs> okay, um, and I have no idea if I managed to pause the right thing. Anyway, um, so the um, the, uh, the vet, that's what the documentary is about. So hopefully you went and watched that and now we'll move on. All right, if you watch the documentary, then what you see in this photograph, uh, this slide here um, should be uh, something that now you recognize, right? Um, in this early factory from 1806, right? All of these machines, right, with the, um, the gears being driven by the belts, being driven by those big, turbines there in the back. Um, those uh, are all being worked by, there's a, in another room is one of those big um, steam engines. Um, now this is a big bespoke steam engine. It's been specifically built. There's no interchangeable parts yet, specifically for this factory. It can't be moved, um, but it is powering, right? All those extra tools, which are helping here um, in this, you know, this factory looks like it's like that 25 or 30 guys working here. And there's a few women, actually, it looks like maybe in this picture as well, um, working to um, make shoes for the growing market here in Philadelphia, which is already getting to be a pretty big city. Um, and so they are working here in this shoe factory now. Um, and then as the little label here explains and as ex is explained in your textbook, uh, almost as soon as you get these bigger factories with 20, you know, 15, 20 employees, and there are multiples of these factories scattered around in Philadelphia, um, you begin to get, you know, laborers working together, um, attempting to work collectively to address their um, employers who are often usually the factory owners as well, because um, everything's still pretty small scale, uh, to improve the conditions of work. Now, sometimes they are looking to, uh, as it says here, raise wages. Sometimes this is about the conditions of work. They want, you know, a longer lunch break or they want um, to control when they stop work. If there's a work slowdown because orders of shoes have fallen off, then they want, you know, instead of maybe the whole factory being shut down, they want to go to, you know, half day work instead of no work. Or if, you know, there's gonna be some layoffs, they want, you know, it to be the last person hired instead of just the guy that the owner hates or, you know, or, um, you know, they want some control over that. Um, and there's other stories where, for example, the cabinet makers, you know, they want to establish, because they're often paid on piece rates, right? If you make a chair, you get X amount of money. If you make a table, you get Y amount of money. If you make a stool, you get this amount of money. And they want to set, right, stable rates for each one of those items. And then they want, you know, they want all the cabinet makers to agree that those are the rates and you won't make a chair for less than that for anybody in town. 
you know, so there's things, you know, different, different crafts um, try to set these kinds of agreements. The thing is, when they get taken to court, and they do get taken to court, under traditional British common law, they get found guilty of conspiracy. <laughs> this is a conspiracy to restrain trade um, or to act against the interests of their employer. And um, that turns out to be something that workers are going to really, laborers are going to struggle against really almost until the turn of the, the late 1800s or the 1900s, almost into the 20th century before um, it's really clear in law that labor, that working people have the right to, um, to join together in labor unions, to work collectively, to bargain um, with, to, you know, to create a bargaining committee that that bargaining committee has the right legally to represent the interests of workers and negotiate, you know, contracts with employers. Um, and that that's not, you know, impermissible in the, in the eyes of the law. And so one of the things that workers discover here, beginning with these uh, court decisions in the early 1800s, is that they're going to have to work not only to pressure their employers collectively, but they're going to have to change the law. Um, and so we'll see, particularly in the Northeast, where, as we look at some maps later on in this slideshow, um, there's going to be a number of political parties. They're often called the Working Men's Party party in the, the United States, WPUS, um, are going to try to create a political party. And one of their primary purposes is to change the law, to make it possible for working men um, to bargain collectively, to actually work um, and talk together and then you know go together collectively to present their interests to their employers and not be found guilty of conspiracy. Um, that turns out to be one of the things that they're going to have to do. Um, so, you know, working men um, are fight and women because there's already working women um, and the women are working in shoe factories. Women are working in um, some of the early uh, textile factories. And so they're, they too are finding that they're going to have to um, be able to to gain the, the legal right to do what they're doing. And then, of course, turn that legal right into collective labor action. Um, this is also a period of incredible economic swings. Um, there is an economic crisis basically when a decade. Um, so there's an economic crisis in the 18 teens, right after the War of 1812 is over, so the war ends in 1815, and there's the classic post-war recession. Um, there's another one in the 1820s. Uh, there's another one in the 1830s, the Panic of 1837 here. There's another small economic crash in the 1840s. There's another big one in the 1850s. Um, and with each one of those swings, and they kind of get bigger, um, actually, each one, each decade, you know, the, 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 the peak is higher, and then the crash is more dramatic. So this one here in 1837 was pretty huge. Um, and it takes a lot of people down. It just wipes people out because because uh, the the swing up is pretty exuberant. So people get really excited, and there's a lot of growth. There's a lot of investment. A lot of people get jobs, um, and a lot of people get overextended. And then when the crash comes, people are just wiped out. So you know, here's a working man, um, and the specie clause is another. There's tremendous concern. The same concerns that led. Um, that were drove a lot of the objection to the stamp tax, you know, that people, you know, used all those bits of commercial paper. And so then to have to pay a tax in coin money on their commercial paper was frustrating or terrifying, depending on your fiscal situation. Um, there were similar kinds of thing, issues came up again and again and again, um, because the United States government is not yet printing money in the way that you and I are used to dollar bills. Um, and so there's still all kinds of commercial paper floating around and then periodically people want to go back and have coin money, you know, that that's the real money. And the, the different valuations that are assigned to the different kinds of commercial paper also, you know, get really caught up in these kinds of ebbs and flows in the economy. So that's what the, the specie clause um, are coming to get this family and they're getting wiped out and they're getting, there they come. Um, uh, because they can't pay their rent, so they're going to get thrown out on the street. Um, so these are some of the big patterns in the economy. All right, so um, as the country grows, what are some of the big things that help it grow? Well, obviously, as people discover that they want to be able to um, pull things together, 
um, and create, um, um, draw more materials in, right? Because they're going to make more um, and then be able to sell more. So you're going to have to get your finished goods out. Then they're going to need to improve transportation, right? They, they're going to want to bring stuff in faster and they also want to bring in greater quantities. The United States, of course, remains primarily a huge exporter of raw materials. So transatlantic shipping remains a huge thing. Um, the um, Northeast remains a huge um, builder of ships. Shipbuilding is a huge industry still. And the clipper ship, right? That, that classic three-masted sailing ship, wide-bodied, incredibly stable, very difficult to sink, um, is sort of the, um, the, 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 the highest form of that ship. Um, and it is, it carries the bulk of the transatlantic cargo really until the age of steam ships take over. Um, and there it is, that's what it looks like. And it is an American development, sort of re ultra refinement of that kind of ship. There's another one. Now, eventually as steam engines, like you saw in the documentary are more and more refined, they do start putting steam engines. This is a kind of a hybrid step here, this male steamer. So you can see it still has sails, but it also, there in the middle are two little smoke stacks because this, is starting to um, have some extra assist. Now the steam engines that are put on these boats aren't strong enough to push them the whole way across the Atlantic and they can't carry enough coal uh, to make that journey either with those little engines. Um, so they're there to assist the sails, they're there to keep the boat moving if the wind drops completely. Um, and so they, you know, they keep the ship moving on a more predictable uh, schedule. Um, and so you, there's a period definitely where you see these kind of hybrid boats, um, both in commercial shipping and also in naval vessels. All right, we've looked at this map before when it comes to ground transportation and um, transportation inside the United States. So this is our classic here in 1800, um, where uh, New York is our starting point and transportation to Philadelphia is really good. You can get to Philadelphia in a day. Transportation to Boston, not so good. <laughs> Still takes a long time. Uh, Chicago is really far away, right? If you want to go to Chicago for business, that takes you all summer to make one trip, right? Six weeks to Chicago, six weeks back home again. So yeah, you send a nephew you don't care about very much um, because between um, Detroit and Chicago, it's a swamp. It's a horrible trip. I mean, the the, the traveler's diaries we have uh, describe, you know, the, the mosquitoes the midges in the swamp, just, you know, and the, the swamp growth and bushes are over your head. You can't see in front of you, you can't see to either side, you can't see behind you and the clouds of bugs. It's just, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible journey. Um, so yeah, you don't go yourself if you can possibly avoid it. Um, the trip to New Orleans is four weeks. I mean, these places are really far away. There's nowhere in the world that takes that, that today, if, you know, if you have enough money. Um, takes you six weeks. There's nowhere in the world you can't get in a week if you have enough money to buy the tickets and arrange for travel. Um, so, and you know, if you have enough money to charter private transportation, you can get almost anywhere in the world in a couple of days, um, even now in the midst of a uh, global pandemic. So, um, you know, travel times are just extraordinary based on our own experiences today. So this is 1800. So this is, you know, this is people walking. This is, you know, riding a horse. This is, so this is slow stuff. By 1830, this is what the world looks like. Yeah. Um, so what has begun to happen? Well, road building, right? That's the first thing. You, do, you can go a lot faster if you just build decent roads. Um, so red are better roads. Um, so when we talk about better roads, what are we talking about? We're talking about maintained roads. We're talking about roads that are wide enough for traffic to go both directions without you know, somebody pulling off to the side. We're talking about roads that have been you know, crowned and curved so that rain goes off then into gutters or culverts on the side. We're talking about roads with bridges so you don't splash through rivers or streams. Um, we're talking about roads um, you know, that have switchbacks as you go up hills so the, the grade is more gradual uh, and then with retaining walls, you know, so they don't crumble at the edges. Um, in cities, they're all going to be paved. They're going to be with, paved with bricks or cobblestones um, or with um, early forms of asphalt. 
Um, and you know, anything that makes the surface stable and um, easier for horses to, or oxen to pull wheeled vehicles you know, smoothly and with less effort. Um, you don't get stuck in potholes, your wheels don't break and fall off your vehicle. Um, anything that makes it travel easier and smoother, right, is gonna make it faster. Um, and you definitely see, do you see the one called uh, the National Road out there west of Columbus? It's gonna eventually go all the way to St. Louis. Um, now that is built in pieces. The first piece is built between Baltimore um, and Cumberland headed toward Wheeling. That's built, they start building that one as early as 1811 and it will take until 1830 to get it out to Vandalia. Um, the Wilderness Road, they start somewhat later. Um, the Natchez Trace still later. Um, but you know, eventually they're going to build all of that. Um, uh, it's going to be uh, developed. Um, the green navigable rivers. What is a navigable river? Well, first it has to be deep enough and wide enough, and then of course you maintain it. You pull out, you know, the broken logs. You you know, when trees fall into it in the springtime, um, you know, somebody goes and fishes them out and makes sure there's nothing going to snag. Um, and then of course you have canals, which are essentially man-made rivers where there's enough water. Um, they're fairly shallow, um, but they, you know, they make sure that there's always water so stuff is floatable. So here, Fort Wayne is on the map. <laughs> there were a lot of canals around Fort Wayne. Um, Fort Wayne is here because, of course, Fort Wayne was a portage point that connected um, Lake Erie to ultimately the Mississippi watershed. Um, in the springtime, you could actually float your cargo, but in the rest of the year, you had to carry it, right? Um, ultimately to get it back onto the Wabash River. But once you put in the canal, then you could float it year round, right? Um, and that's what, similarly, what the rest of the canals were about. The most famous canal, of course, is the Erie Canal, which connects uh, the Hudson River to Lake Erie. And when that is connected, in 1830, it just revolutionizes transport because then you have water transport from Chicago through the Great Lakes all of the way um, to the ocean. And that is just extraordinary um, because now um, the whole upper Midwest is connected by water uh, to the Atlantic world and really speeds up the settlement and the density of settlement. And we'll see that in some of the maps we look at toward the end of this presentation. Um, we're going to ignore the white railroad lines in there. So just in 1830, um, you're looking at canals, you're looking at roads, and you're looking at rivers. Now, all of these are old, right? Canals have existed for centuries, and of course, so have road, good roads, and so have navigable rivers. Um, and here in 1840, just a decade later, you see that the road network has grown extensively because already, you know, this, the market revolution, that notion that, you know, improved transportation makes everybody's business better, um, has, uh, is, a, is a truism that is reinforced every time more and better roads are built, so people build more and better roads and invest in those. And the canal network is um, de deeper and richer, particularly there in the Northeast, um, and you're starting to see more canals that are connecting up to Chicago as well um, as people build those. And then, of course, ultimately, you're going to see the rail network. Um, railroads start to come online in the 1830s, but rail, um, rail lines are, it takes a long time to get rail engines that are super reliable. Um, and so uh, at first people are pretty scared of them because they blow up and they have a lot of accidents. But as rail becomes ever more reliable, more and more people want them. And you see, and of course this map is helpfully labeled, slave states in the South, uh, free states in the North, and that's gonna have a big impact by the time we get to the Civil War, that there's so many more railroads in the North. Part of the reason there's so many more railroads in the North is there's just way more people, but also the North is settled by towns. Um, and the South is not, the South is settled by plantations. So um, people in towns, right, raise money to buy shares in to encourage their town to be connected by rail. Um, and so you just see a lot of people up in the North, just as they invested in road building, invested in canal building, they're also super invested in um, getting themselves connected by rail because they understand that their community, you know, lives or dies based on its transportation network to get raw materials in, to send finished goods out, to make sure they're connected um, to the market so that they can be part of this spread of the market economy. 
And, you know, because this is changing the world, people make art about it. And so this is a picture of the Erie Canal. Uh, and you can see the locks because the Erie Canal goes up, right, from the Hudson River is at a lower elevation than Lake Erie. So there have to be a series of locks as you get to, you know, raise um, the you know, boats up and down a series of ele water elevators, if you will. Um, and then in the back, of course, you can see, um, yeah, that's a rail uh, for the rate for the trains as they come in. And of course, <coughs> steam transport, just as it eventually um, makes a difference in the water transport across the transatlantic crossings uh, and shipping, it makes a big difference. Um, this in the river. Um, this is 1859, so this is, you know, another sort of, this is the final articulation of the great riverboat steamboats. These are the ones you think of associated with Mark Twain, right, with the big twin smokestacks and the elegant um, fences and decorative um, stuff at the top. Um, the first river boats with steam on them, you know, appeared in the 1830s. So, you know, this is, you know, 30 years into the evolution of elegant and giant steamboats. Um, St. Paul is also as far up the river as you can go. Um, the Falls of St. Anthony start right there. So that's why St. Paul and um, Minneapolis are where they are because that is the northernmost reach of um, river traffic on the, Minia uh, on the, the Mississippi River. Um, this is just a close in look at um, the um, Northeast uh, and again just showing you about 1840 right before rail becomes huge, um, the interconnectedness of the major roads, um, the wilderness road there, the national road, um, the canals and the rivers and it's a really dense network. And again, those are just the big pieces. And of course, there's tons of local roads that connect, you know, small towns and, and individual farms uh, to those major uh, networks. And again, people paint it. Um, we have another presentation in a couple of weeks talking about the rise of Americans looking for great art. And actually, George Ennis was one of the um, American artists of that era who was then hired to paint this painting. Um, but you really do, it does capture the way these new transportation networks are fundamentally altering and changing the landscape of the United States, you know, so that the biggest built, human built object here um, in this Pennsylvania scene, um, the same Pennsylvania that I kept showing you that picture of the Moravian town of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania is now, you know, not a building. It's not even a, not a, a domestic building or a barn or a school or a church. It's the huge roundhouse, right? Which holds train engines. That's its function. Uh, and then, you know, the train itself, you know, with its big smokestack, um, you know, filling the air uh, as it marks its passage. And then with its long line of, um, it looks like, I don't know, coal cars um, behind it as it changes, you know, the world. Um, pulling through. And here's another one. This is a more artistic westward. The star of empire takes its way. Um, I, uh, I need to um, look up the artist on this one. Um, but this one, you know, you can see, you know, how quickly the transformation is coming, right? I mean, trains are coming west even as the west is being settled. So that there's a log settler's cabin there on the left, but the train is already shooting past um, and, you know, the, the cabin there behind it, you know, has a laundry line and on the laundry line are white cotton shirts. And that cotton, of course, is being grown in the South um, on the plantations by enslaved workers and then sent North uh, to be produced um, and woven into cotton fabric um, in the textile factories. And then it's probably, you know, Maybe they, the farm wife has bought the cotton bolts of fabric, but you know, just as likely to be honest, she's bought the shirts um, and they have been sewn into shirts um, by uh, sweatshop workers in the Northeast. Um, and she's actually bought shirts uh, that have been carried west on the train, right? So, you know, they are not an isolated, they, I mean, you know, for all of the farmhouse looks, like it's out there in the middle of nowhere, those cotton shirts on that line and the train remind us that already the American West is not isolated. Um, I mean, the experience of living in that farm is individually isolating 
you know, I'm sure that they had, you know, days and weeks where they didn't really speak to anyone. Um, and it was an isolating experience psychologically, but broadly speaking, they're not isolated at all. They are part of a deeply interconnected network and the things that they grow uh, once they start farming out here on this farmstead are shipped east on a train uh, to be sold in Eastern markets or even transatlantic markets, depending on what it is they're gonna produce on this farm. Um, and this is that growth of trains um, and how quickly it comes, right? 1850 on the left, small green spread, um, 1860, just 10 years later, huge spread. And again, the Northern states have so many more. The principal east-west lines, those are the ones um, that where you have side-by-side -side tracks, right? That's where you have the ability to, you know, for eastbound and westbound trains, uh, don't have to stop because they each have their own dedicated lane. Um, when you don't have side-by-side -side parallel sets of track, when you just have one track and you have two trains coming up to each other, right, then you have to reach a point where one train pulls off into what's called a siding. Um, the, you know, and then the, west, the eastbound train can keep going. And then once it's passed, then the westbound train, sometimes the siding connects back up, but a lot of times it didn't. And they actually have to back up, back onto the track and then go forward again. Um, so as you can imagine, a lot less traffic can go on that single line. But once you get to a principal line or a trunk line, they were sometimes called, and you have parallel track, you know, two sets or three sets or four sets of parallel lines, then, you know, the amount of traffic, the amount of freight that can travel those lines begins to double and quadruple. The other thing that was happening on the northern train lines by the 1850s and um, in that decade is they were moving to what's called a uniform gauge. That is, the tracks are all, no matter who owns the, the, that set of track and runs the engines that pull freight or passenger cars across that set of track, they're all the same distance apart. What that means is that I can load up um, my freight in New York or New Jersey or Rhode Island or Boston in a freight car and designate that freight car, that full freight car to go all the way to Chicago or past Chicago. Um, and it can just be moved, right? That, that whole car can be moved from engine to engine to engine as it is carried by different companies westward um, without anybody having to go inside the car and carry packages on and, on and off. Um, and if nothing has to be taken on and off that car. Um, and that, of course, dramatically lowers the cost of shipping stuff west. Um, because, you know, anytime somebody touches your bag, they have to be paid. I mean, they may not be paid a lot, but they do have to be paid. And that, you know, that increases the cost of shipping. So if you, every time you can reduce the number of times your thing has to be touched, then it's cheaper, right? That was the whole point of trying to find the water route to China all those centuries earlier. Um, was that, you know, every time you, you know, carried a sack, you know, by donkey across the Himalayas, you know, every time, you know, it moved to a new trader that added on to the price of a sack of silk or the sack of spices by the time it got to the European market. Whereas if you could just load everything up in Ceylon and sail it, then nobody touched it between Ceylon and, you know, Calais. And so, you know, you sold it for less and that, um, well, you sold it for just a little bit less, <laughs> and then the, that in-between amount was your profit. So you know, go you. Um, and you know, you see the same kind of thing here. Um, so that's, um, uh, but that's why those trunk lines were uh, important, is they drop costs, but they also just you know dramatically increase quantity. Um, and how do you manage keeping track of where everybody is in the system? Well, obviously, you are looking for um, uh, better and better communication, you know, real-time communication. And this is where Samuel Morse comes in, is he develops in the 1840s and goes into wide-scale practice. In the 1850s, the telegraph, um, beep, 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 right, long and short. Um, and that allows for um, near instantaneous communication. And so, you know, the rail networks are able to keep track of where everybody is. Um, and they are very early adopters of this. And of course, you know, you can string the wires right along the rail lines, um, which is also super convenient. Um, they're not the only people who use it. Financial markets uh, adopt it really quickly, and we'll talk more about them a little bit later. 
uh, in the semester, but this is really another revolutionary thing. And here's our maps, which show us what a difference it makes. Well, maybe we don't have that map. Um, This was a slide that showed us our side-by-side -side transportation maps um, that would have shown us <laughs> that by 1857, it only takes a day and a half to get from New York to Chicago on the train. So that's our big excite excitement there um, with our trunk line and uh, it was our swirly transportation map. Okay. Um, uh, this is a different way to look at that same um, spread of information, um, which is that the United States government is able to sell uh, huge amounts of West land in the West, and that transportation network makes that sale um, much more attractive. Now, remember, the United States owns all that Western land first that we got um, as a result of the treaty with Great Britain in 1783. Um, the land between the Appalachians and the Mississippi River, and then with the purchase of the Louisiana Territory in 1804 um, from the Mississippi River West, um, that huge um, big swath of land that Jefferson bought from Napoleon. Um, and that's, you know, we treat the government treated that as a land bank, right? And sold the land usually in small pieces, but a couple of times there in 1818 and another time in 1836 and another time in 1855 in big bumps for various and sundry political reasons that we'll talk about. But the ability to sell right in those big chunks, which then as you can see created a huge economic crash right afterwards, so it wasn't always a wise idea, um, was because people could get out there, right? that the land had opened up. And part of the reason it had opened up because there had been that big, you know, the national road um, and the canals had made it possible for people to get out there. And then of course, by the 1850s, there had been that next big jump and the trains were taking people out there. And, you know, farmers are like, yes, I can go out there and I can grow stuff because now I can ship it east or I can ship it south because I can put it on the train, I can put it on the canals, I can get it under the river, I can put it on the steamboats, I can get it out, I can get it into the international marketplace and I can make money, right? So this is a worthwhile investment. And so that's part of what makes these big land sales possible. Um, another thing that makes, you know, especially that last big bump in the 1850s attractive is, you know, a couple of big developments in terms of, of agricultural technology, um, specific especially to the conditions in the westward United States. Um, we get the plow, that was a big one. Um, they had to have a steel bladed plow to cut the prairie grass. The wood plows couldn't do it, even iron tipped plows couldn't do it, so the steel plow was super necessary. The other thing that made a huge difference was the McCormick Reaper, um, which was developed in the 1840s um, and was shown off in 1851. Um, but it was, uh, this will allow one person to harvest much bigger quantities of uh, wheat in particular. Um, and it means that one guy can buy a bigger farm and harvest uh, significantly larger amounts of grain in the small harvest window that you have. Um, and um, that was just huge, right? Um, and it entices a lot more people to go out there, buy bigger pieces of property, um, and really go into big, much larger scale commercial production, because obviously this is way more than a family needs. This is all about growing for the marketplace. Um, the cotton gen was, of course, originally developed as a hand crank tool, but you could very quickly adapt it to a steam driven tool. And that is fantastic because all those new factories will take any amount of cotton that you can grow. And one of the things that had always retarded American interest in producing or growing cotton had been the ability to clean it, to take all those stupid sticky seeds out. Um, the hand crank machine made a big difference. But of course, once you could put steam power, I hook a smaller and smaller, more effective steam engine and belts, right? And make bigger cotton gens that will, you know, that work on exactly the same principles. <laughs> just grinding through the cotton to smush those little seeds out, crack them open and smush them out, clean that cotton. Um, 
then you know you can clean so much more cut and get it more ready for the marketplace and that is what they're doing so this picture really gives you a good look at the way even um right at the plantation end they are fully entered into this industrial age right that is a steam-powered cotton gin that is working to clean the cotton that is being grown but it, this is right industrialized commercial farming um you know sometimes there can be a desire to romanticize the plantation as some kind of you know um opposite to um, you know, the industrialized North, but, oh, such bullshit. No, right. This is, I mean, look at that piece of machinery, right? It is simply the other half, right, of the industrialized North. This is industrialized commercial production of the raw material that is necessary, that it is producing, right, the fiber that goes into the factory. Um, and it is every bit as industrialized as uh, the factory itself. Um, this is factory farming. This is just another picture, um, which gives you um, a because it's more focused on the cotton going down into the chute um, of it. And then so the seeds just kind of fall out around where her feet are. And then the cotton um, goes out the side where the person is kind of looking through the window there in case you wondered what happened to the cotton. OK. <clears throat> so how does it where does the cotton go? Well, it goes up north. Uh, first, it goes. Uh, to small, very small setups that are modeled directly on the um, uh, textile industry in England. In fact, they had to sneak the technology out because England actually very early on attempted to create um, industrial secrets. And it was um, a violation of British law to uh, share how to build some of those machines. Um, yeah, so naturally people had to sneak with the information out of their heads, out of in their heads, out of the country, but of course they totally did. Uh, and yeah, so the machines were built in the United States. And at first there were just a few um, small scale machines, but you know, rapidly there were Americans who were like, oh, hey, why should we send all the cotton internationally when we could build some cotton textile mills here in the United States? Um, and yeah, so they do, right? So there is one of the floating shuttles um, with some spindles there in the United States. And Lowell becomes, right, sort of the premier uh, textile town, textile city, ultimately industrialized city in the United States. It's built by a guy named Charles Lowell um, there on the Merrimack River. Um, it was um, mostly farmland um, when he and his group of investors bought it to create a model industrial city. Um, he had the idea of creating the first integrated mills. So would, believe it or not, nobody had done that yet. So he was gonna put a spinning factory and a, tex, a weaving factory in the same building. So he's gonna buy bales of cotton. They're gonna go in one door, they're gonna be spun into yarn or thread and then they go, just go through door and be put on the weaving machines uh, and then fabric is gonna come out the other door. Um, so that was his one of his big insights. The other, of course, in the context of the United States was where was he going to find his workers? There were not tons of unemployed or underemployed people, which meant that the cost of labor was fairly high in comparison to England, where the cost of labor was very low because of the enclosure movement, which you should have heard about in the documentary, which you should have already watched. Um, there was no comparable thing going on in the United States. However, in New England, there were a lot of unmarried young women who did not have immediately great prospects. Why? Well, New England was, right, one of the oldest uh, settled regions of the United States. And by this point in the 18 teens and 1820s, had reached density by the standard of the day. And what that meant was that the farms could no longer be subdivided. They had reached the smallest size that they could reach, and so only one child could inherit. Um, that meant all of the younger sons and daughters uh, had to find someplace else to go. Many of the younger sons would go west, of course, and they would settle western New York, western Pennsylvania, and then, of course, they were going to be the people who moved into Ohio and Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa in time, Kansas, right? So that they are part of that whole big flood. 
Um, another group of them will be part of the 25% of the American population that is going to move into cities um, because, you know, they grew up on a farm and they're like, yeah, been there, done that, don't need to live on a farm ever again in my life. Um, and so they're going to be that part of that flood. Um, so a lot of them, for example, are going to be the young men who move into Lowell to build all of the buildings that you are looking at that are built between 1820 and 1832, right? All of those big factories and all of those houses have to be built by somebody. And a lot of that is going to be built by young men who are, you know, kicking the dirt of farming off their heels um, with no intention of returning to it. Now, some of those young men are going to, you know, find a local wife and take her with because especially if you're going west to farm, having a wife with you to start off is very, very sensible because farming is really takes the work of two adults. Um, but not all of them are going to do that. Um, and, um, so all of the young women who don't get taken with are simply left behind. And if they don't have good prospects for marriage, then they just become a drag on their families and they get stuck either in their parents' home or in the home of a, si of a married sibling as an extraneous spinster wife, uh, excuse me, spinster sister, spinster daughter. And um, especially for marginal families, that's, that's really a kind of a drag economically. Um, and so what Lowell saw was that there was a really big population of these women and that he could offer them work <laughs> in these factories. Um, and, uh, but that they would not, they, it was very difficult to entice them to go into the cities um, because these farm families, you know, were not, they didn't want their daughters to go into the cities because the cities were, you know, sites of danger, particularly for unmarried young women. Um, and so he said, well, no, I'm going to build this new industrial model city and I will build boarding houses. That's what all the light green buildings are. And in these model boarding houses, there will be, there will be a matron who is in charge of every boarding house, a respectable woman who's been carefully vetted, a widow or a, a you know, an elder woman figure. Um, and there will be strict hours and there'll be family style dining and you know, somebody will be looking after them when they're not at work. Uh, but in their spare time, you know, between the dinner hour and lights out, you know, your daughters will have time, you know, to be doing, you know, improving things. They can do Bible study. They can be part of choral groups. They can be in part of improving groups, you know, mission support societies or, you know, other similar types of things. Um, and this turned out to be a super appealing offer. Families were very enthusiastic about it. Um, girls were enthusiastic about it. And the drummers, um, uh, these were the guys who were hired to go knock, literally knock on doors. Do you have any daughters who might be interested in this employment opportunity? Um, you know, those girls began to arrive in droves. And as you can see, right, the mills began to be built. Um, you know, the Merrimack Mills, there in 1823, the Lowell Mills in 1829, the Middlesex Mills in 1831, the Lawrence Mills in 1833, right? I mean, they just, you know, boom, 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 boom. Um, the, they come. Um, and churches quickly follow because this is a well-churched population of New England girls, right? You know, um, and uh, this is actually the middle of the Second Great Awakening, and so they want to keep going to church. And yes, there turned to be a lot of prayer societies and, and, and Bible study societies and choral groups, um, but they do all kinds of things. They have, you know, they have sewing circles and they support mission groups, um, but they do more fun stuff too. They have poetry writing societies and play writing societies and novel study, novel reading <laughs> groups, and um, they start a newspaper um, called the Lowell Offering, and uh, eventually they get involved in labor politics because they are factory workers and they have issues with their employers. And just like, you know, the Philadelphia Shoemakers 30 years earlier, they realized that if they band together, um, they are more likely to have their issues heard. Um, and they will stage the first large scale citywide walkout of um, one industry in the United States um, in order to uh, protest a wage cut is actually what they are protesting. Um, and they will go on to be involved in a host of labor issues. By the 1850s, there are several, by that point, longtime mill women um, who will be pro uh, testifying before one of the early committees dealing with worker safety issues um, in the Massachusetts legislature. Because as you can imagine, in these mills, 
um, working with all that cotton fluff, the the air condition, the air quality is horrible, and they have lung um, issues. Um, so they get involved in all kinds of things. There's abolitionist societies. They, I mean, they're 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 very active and engaged. Um, there's a couple of them there. Um, this is what the mills look like. They're tall, right? Um, you know, four or five story buildings, a um, lot of light because this is before gas lighting. So they're day lit for the most part. Um, and that's what they, a couple of my slides are not here. Don't really understand. Well, this one, this missing slide uh, was just going to show the growth of mills. And I, again, I don't know why these slides are not showing up. Um, here, um, but once the um, number of mills were success, once the Lowell mill was so successful, the model is picked up all over um, Massachusetts. And there's another slide where we'll see this. Um, and then, as once you know, the model is effective um, uh, for textiles, and people you know pick up this model, and in shoemaking, of course it's rapidly expanded into all kinds of other industries. And, um, you know, not just around the Boston area, but, you know, uh, throughout all of New England, and then, you know, through the other older, more densely settled regions of the United States, spread it very quickly westward um, into um, places along the Ohio River. Um, you know, Cincinnati there, um, the Detroit area, um, along the shores of, you know, uh, Lake Erie, um, and Lake Ontario, uh, you know, again, more places have uh, got a lot of people. Um, and of course, you know, places where there's always been a lot of skilled tradesmen, places where there's a lot of money for investment in building factories. Um, and, um, you know, cotton, of course, though, in contrast, grows a lot of, you know, grows in the South. And so while there is, has always been a lot of, um, cotton textile industry work in the Northeast, it's not the only place, right? There were certainly plenty of people who said, hey, just as it seems absurd to ship our cotton all the way across the ocean, why don't we not ship it that even up to New England? Why don't we, you know, process, um, do the processing work of cotton closer to home? And so this is what this um, comparison map uh, set is about. Um, people were definitely doing, like I said, you know, as soon as the model was up and running in Britain, there were people who were like, hey, we can spin cotton here into yarn. Um, and so you see in that in 1810 uh, on the left, and by 1840, again, that super density um, there. Um, and the two red circles, the one on the right is Lowell, in case you were wondering. That's where Lowell is. That's where the Merrimack River is. Um, uh, but, you know, the, it's a lot of places. And the ones in the South, by the way, some of those are definitely factories with enslaved people working in them. You can totally put slaves in factories. There's nothing about a factory that says um, that free workers have to work there. Now, some of them do have free workers, um, but you don't have to. Uh, so it totally depends. Um, now, women also don't only work in textiles, you know, women, once women are, it's clear that women can work in other kinds of factories, they do. Women work in the boot and shoe industry, which is factory work. Um, women do work in textiles. Uh, women also continue to work in domestic service. That's where they're working as maids in other people's homes, cleaning, caring for children, cooking, etc. cetera. Um, and the hat and bonnet industry is a big place for women. Some of those are factories. A lot more of that is sweatshop work or even uh, what's called taking, um, putting out work, um, which is you go to a warehouse type place or shop sometimes kind of depends and you get the raw materials, uh, you pay for them or sometimes you buy them on credit. It kind of depends on the situation and you take it home, you make them at home. Uh, and once you have enough made or used up all your materials, then you take the finished products back, you sell them back. Um, and you know, the, um, and that's how you make your money. Um, and you, because you kind of work on it when you have time in and around um, your other household tasks. Um, and so it sort of depends which model that you're using. And as you can see, lots of people like that um, work. Uh, you also see, right, three and a half percent of the women wage earners here. Um, 
uh, are um, moving into teaching. This is a very, this is that first little foot in the door. Um, why are they moving in? Because they're cheaper than men. Uh, and the men in, who have monopolized teaching are hating this, hating this. They fight it hugely because when women come in, um, because they get paid less, they force men out. And so men don't want to lose their access to these, this profession, which had, they had monopolized and controlled. And so there's a lot of tension about this movement of women into teaching and a lot of hostility and pushback about it. All right, so this is a set of maps which gives us a sense of how, the, what the impact of uh, textile manufacturing is on communities and how that impact is much broader than simply the people who work in the factory. What happens when you start having large quantities of manufactured textiles? Um, you know, so it has an effect, obviously, on the spread of plantation agriculture and on the lives of the enslaved people who grow the cotton. And it has a life impact on, you know, the creation of factories and the people who work in the factories. What kind of impact does it have for people who buy the textiles? Well, this is what we're looking at here. Um, so we have two maps, uh, 1820 before on top, before the Erie Canal goes in, and 1845, uh, about 15 years after the Erie Canal co goes in. And these are um, home textile production, which is something you can get by looking at tax um, maps um, and probate records. This is how this particular set of data was put together. And uh, what we see, right, is first of all, overall, there's a drop in home textile manufacture. But the drop is most extreme in those counties um, where the Erie Canal goes um, because, right, the the uh, the it the new cotton cloth that is coming through is so cheap in comparison um, to what you could make at home that it's not worth it to make it at home anymore, right? So that it's clearly much better for those households for the labor that had once gone into preparing um, household linens, right, at home, right, growing. Um, uh, almost all of this is linens, right? You, so you grow flax and then you spin and you weave that into um, um, household um, linen fabrics. Um, that, that, that's simply not worth your time anymore, that it's much better to convert that household farming time into some other money-making activity, butter, cheese, eggs, jam, preserves, anything else, and then use that income, um, that much higher income to purchase cotton. Uh, fabrics, um, because those are by comparison so cheap. Um, and so, right, it, the, the existence of those cottons, right, they change everybody's lives, not just the lives of the people who uh, uh, grow the cotton, not just on the lives of the people who work in the textile mills, but also just lives of your average farming family in upstate New York change dramatically because of this industrial revolution, because of the rise of the textile factory, the impact is way bigger and broader than just in terms of the people who are actually in the factory making this stuff. Um, here's another slide that is not showing up. I don't know what's happening here. And another slide that didn't show up. Okay. Um, there's a couple of other broad changes um, that take place um, here as a result of all of this growth in the United States. Um, those two slides that didn't show up were not there. One was a cartoon about you know, the impact on lives of women, uh, and one was a bar chart showing that age of first marriage goes up, um, which is the impact of um, urban life, right? And all of these women going to work in factories. And um, so women are able to live independently for a little bit longer. Also, right, as part of the ebbs uh, and flows in the economy, working class families tend to postpone that age of first marriage a little bit, um, is one of the things that happen. And um, there is some pushback and hostility about some of these changes in people's lives and some concern about this independence that women are getting. And so there was a cartoon poking fun at that, um, but also indicating some concern. All right. 
Um, but as the United States um, booms, right, it does become a place for renewed immigration. Immigration really dropped off uh, in the era of the revolution, picks back up again, drops back off during the War of 1812, um, and but then begins to pick back up. And then there's another huge swell of immigration between 1845 and 1855. Now, immigration as always pushes and pulls. Um, there's definitely things pushing people out, particularly, of course, the Irish. This is the peak the potato famine. Um, which is always, remember, a politically engineered famine. Um, the Irish, of course, will tell you it was an attempted genocide. <laughs> um, and they're not entirely crazy to tell you that because Ireland was growing tons of food, um, but all of that food was destined for England, right? That's what the corn laws were about. All of the Irish corn, the wheats, the grains, all of that was expropriated um, by the English and it was shipped across the channel to England and a lot of it was sold elsewhere in the world. Um, the only thing the Irish were left with was their garden plots, um, including primarily their potatoes. So when the blight killed the potatoes, they had nothing to eat, even though they were growing in their regular fields, all kinds of food that was collected and taken away from them. Um, and so they were in terrible dire need and they start leaving Ireland in droves. Uh, and so that's the, um, the blue line here. The Germans are not facing famine, but they're facing a lot of political disruptions in Germany. And so that's why they're coming. And so that's why you get that huge black peak. That's the total there. Um, why choose the United States? Because they go everywhere. I mean, there's a huge wave of Irish immigration that goes everywhere in the world. They go to Latin America, they go to Argentina, um, they go to Mexico, <laughs> they go to Brazil, they go to um, Australia, they go to Canada, I mean, they go, they go everywhere. So, I mean, we are hard, the United States is hardly the only place that the Irish go. They, they, and a lot of them just go elsewhere in Europe and they just, they have to go everywhere. As with the Germans, Germans go everywhere too. The United States just get one piece of it. But we do certainly get a lot, um, and we get a lot because the United States is a booming place in those decades, in that decade. Um, and so here's a painting that captures some German immigrants asking for directions there in New York. Um, I don't know why this slide looks so weird. It did not look weird yesterday. Okay, so definitely some weird things going on because it doesn't look weird in the thumbnail, but it looks weird on the large, on the thumbnail it looks fine, but on the large screen it looks terrible. Maybe when you look at it, because um, I have left the regular download PowerPoint up for you. So when you download this, you will be able to see um, that this is a quote from Samuel Morse. Yes, the same Samuel Morse um, that invented the telegraph. Um, but he toured Europe in the 1830s, and um, he was he was a hardcore. Uh, Second Great Awakening Protestant, and he was particularly horrified by the Catholic Church and by Catholicism. Um, and he came home and was very horrified by the rise of uh, Catholic immigration into the United States. And that was before it got really big in the 1840s and 1850s. So you can only imagine if I thought by then. Um, and so this was part of a, um, a book he wrote called Imminent Dangers to the Free Institutions of the United States Through Foreign Immigration. <laughs> yes, there has been a strain um, of Americans pretty much since the beginning of the United States, but really kicking off after the War of 1812, um, who were really concerned that the fundamental character of the United States starting from whenever they their kickoff, and it's often from their imagined childhood, um, is going to be fundamentally altered by whatever new, the new group that is arriving to the United States in their adulthood is. And for him, it's Catholics, um, Irish Catholics and German Catholics in particular. Um, uh, and that they're gonna somehow completely change the basic order of society, and they're gonna you know, change all the American institutions because they're just not gonna understand how things are done and they're gonna make it all different and everything is gonna be made horrible. Um, 
and you know that's just going to be um, an awful, awful thing. Um, so the full quote reads, um, what was dimly seen by the prophetic eye of Jefferson is actually passing under our own eyes. Already have foreigners increased in the country to such a degree that they justly give us alarm. They feel themselves to be strong, so strong as to organize themselves even as foreigners into foreign bands. And this for the purpose of influencing our elections. That they are men who having professed to become Americans by accepting our terms of naturalization do yet in direct contradiction to their professions plan together as a separate interest and retain their foreign appellation that it is with such separate foreign interest organizing in the midst of us, the Jesuits in the pay of foreign powers are tampering. That is this foreign core of religionists that Americans of both parties have been for years in the habit of basely and traitorously encouraging to erect into an umpire of our political divisions. Thus virtually at surrendering the government into the hands of despotic powers. In view of these facts, which every day's experience proves to be facts, it is not, is it not high time that a true American spirit were roused to resist these alarming inroads of foreign influence upon our institutions, to avert dangers to which we have hitherto shut our eyes, and which, if not remedied, and that immediately will inevitably change the whole character of our government. Uh, I repeat what I first said that. It is no party question. It concerns Native Americans of all parties. What he meant, by the way, uh, here uh, was that um, the uh, the um, you know that there were places where there were either enough Germans or enough Irish that you could appeal to them to join your side, and you would win. So you you know you appeal to their interests. Um, that's what he was concerned about. Um, so here they are, for example, you know, there were enough Irish uh, and Germans here, the Irish represented by the whiskey barrel, the Germans represented by the beer barrel. Uh, and so, you know, together they were able to steal the election represented here by carrying away the ballot box while the Americans, you know, got into a big fight behind them. <laughs> so, um, also, of course, you know, the Irish and the Germans were drunkards. So that was another reason that you didn't like them. Um, I, yeah. So, that, yeah, that's, that's a very attractive image. The solution to this problem, of course, was education. Um, and so the, you know, the idealized American schoolhouse. Um, this is an 1871 painting. So it's, you know, it's, it's not, this is not, this is still more idealized looking a bit backward. Um, um, but this is, um, you know, the, you know, the notion that somehow this would inculcate Americans by, you know, teaching everybody the same thing and this would help them all become the same. And of course, this is one of those young women who's moving into the teaching profession, especially focusing on younger children. Um, on the other hand, this is a time period in, you know, 1830 to 1850 where literacy rates, um, do go way up because there is a big expansion in the attempt to make sure that all children are taught to read. So from 50, from just about half to almost uh, three quarters of the American population over the age of 15 um, are literate by 1850. Um, and that is a huge jump. And it is because of an investment, it is because of investments in um, basic education. Um, and then sort of the last topic for today is this spread of the population, just the incredible demographic growth, which is both growth and movement westward, but also the density of population in the east, which is largely a growth in urbanization in small towns. Um, so this is, you know, people moving westward. This is 1836. Um, and you can see, you know, that obviously the most dense places are, you know, not surprisingly the places where people have lived the longest in the United States. Um, 1820 on the top, 1860 on the bottom, you know, and, um, you know, again, you know, New England, um, that whole stretch down into the upper Chesapeake, um, and then the immediate west side of the Appalachian Mountains along the shores of the southern shore of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario um, into Ohio, um, you know, that's the place where the populations are 
the most dense, but also of course, just spreading deep into the Ohio, down the shores um, of the Mississippi um, in the region where cotton is being grown. And we're gonna look a lot more at the cotton belt in time. Um, here's our growth of cities, pretty exciting, right? You know, the old cities, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, they're right there where they've always been. Um, and then in 1860, you know, New York is huge, Boston is huge, Philadelphia is huge, but we see that they've been joined now by St. Louis, by Chicago, by Cincinnati, um, Louisville, Montgomery, New Orleans, right? You know, these cities are also growing um, and beginning to really make a big difference. Buffalo, um, Albany, right? All of these cities are growing. This is a picture of Boston taken in 1860 from a balloon. Yeah, getting into some aerial photography um, by a photographer named James Black. He was big into experimenting with stuff like this. Um, and you can see, you know, by 1860, Boston is really, you know, those are some buildings that are what, six, eight, 10 stories tall, a lot of narrow staircases there. Um, all brick, you know, all beginning to look terribly modern uh, in many ways. Um, and yet out there in Boston Harbor, that's a clipper ship, right? See those three masts out there? Yeah, same old clipper ship that we started the presentation with. Um, and this is an 1860 Boston again, church spire there in the background. But in the foreground, it's not, doesn't blow up super well, um, but this was a water festival because Boston had finished putting in a uh, city water right in the heart of downtown. And that is a fountain. Yeah, they had just turned it on. Um, so they were pretty excited by, <laughs> by their fountain. Um, so, you know, I mean, this is so growth here also represents technological growth just in the spread of the trains. Um, you know, the, in the modern industry, but also some real developments in terms of urbanization as well. Um, so there you go. This is this presentation. And now um, I uh, hope this will all be online. We'll see.